path in our study through the New Testament book of 1 John. We are in the second chapter this week and um, had planned on doing quite a bit more in this chapter, but the section that we have here, it's interesting in, in just its construction, and uh, we'll get to that in just a little bit, but the more that I thought about this, I thought it's a very, very important matter uh, for us to address, not only understanding a little bit of the history of the time, uh, but also given our modern day, the way that things are. And so I believe that this was uh, cautionary. The whole book was cautionary, and we're going to really start to see that next week as we get into uh, some things that he says about Antichrist as uh, as a singular and Antichrist, those that would do the work of, of who that person is, or at least of the message uh, ultimately that will come from that. So we get into that here shortly. But what's said here, once again, uh, what I believe is taking place here, and I think most, most scholars would agree, and you can tell kind of by the things that, that uh, John is emphasizing here so much, in the first century, especially at the close of it, where John is writing this, um, you'll see it in Paul's writing as well. It was already in place, but there is a group of people known as the Gnostics. And so from the from what we understand of them, again, it's there's not a lot that's written. So it's not like you're going to do some huge deep dive and find out all the names and the people and every particular thing that they uh, that they taught. It's not that it wasn't that well organized. What we had more um, was you can kind of piece it together by the arguments, if you will, that were made by the apostles and the writers of the or the writers of the uh, the uh, the books that are here. So, um, books of the New Testament, I should say. So, it's important for us to kind of piece those things together, but they got the, the classification as being the Gnostics, and uh, Gnostic is just taken from the Greek word gnosis, and that's knowledge. So, a person just, just by looking at the title that they were given, you can kind of piece together that there are those people that would say, we have knowledge, and by saying that and, and putting yourself in a different category, it would put you in some type of opposition or opposed to those people. You would show yourself as being somewhat different from them. So this little section that we have here really kind of helps to understand. He's, he's about to get to, as we uh, look at it starting at verse 15 next week, he's going to start to talk about some of the people and the error that was coming into the church without going into a lot of specifics, but it's said as a cautionary thing. And so here, in this case, in these, these short verses, 12, 13, and 14, he's talking to them about the things that they know and what it is that makes them who they are and how they can know that, that they are saved, that they know that they are his. It's not some exclusive or, or separate knowledge that's just unique to some small group of people. But the things that God has said, he has said to the whosoevers. And again, uh, John has used that term, uh, quoting from Jesus, really from John 3, 16, that whosoever believes. So the gospel was presented to all men. And so it wasn't something that's only there for the exclusive uh, you know, uh, reasons of only reaching a select audience. What God said, and, and especially through the things that Jesus spoke and then the people after him, they made it that everyone could understand it. It wasn't something that would be exclusive to some group of people independent of everyone else and that it would take some kind of superior knowledge or intellect or, or revelation or whatever it may be. So he's able to address this in very general terms and, and there are a couple of different views that, that uh, uh, people hold to on this about you know what are the classifications because he mentions little children, uh, youthful men, and uh, then fathers. And so it seems as though there's some people that are excluded. We'll deal with that. But he says, I've written to you before. The tenses change. I've written and I have. I now write to you. I'm sorry, he starts that by saying, I, I write these things to you. And then he changes the tense by saying, I have written. So um, we'll look at what that is as we kind of get into the text a little bit and uh, what are the views on that. And really the, the, way, the, the way that he addresses the people as children, young men, and then the elder men, the, the fathers. And so what does that do about excluding the women from this? Are they excluded in this whole thing that's being said here? So we'll get into all of those little bits and details and the nuances of it. But I want to make sure that we understand it because of the days in which we live. We will, we will encounter people from time to time 
um, people that kind of burst onto the scene. And uh, they're coming to us with different knowledge, something that has not really been spoken of before. They claim some kind of knowledge. And uh, a lot of times these people are the ones who are also uh, you know, kind of blaming the what their their revelations that they've get that they've been given on something that the Holy Spirit has uh, really shown to them, and it's kind of like a new and a unique kind of a thing. And whenever you hear that, buyer beware. Um, just be really, really careful when you hear somebody talk like that, because uh, first of all, it's not biblical. Um, the idea that th that God's going to give some private revelation about something that is going to really be a game changer to people. Um, like this, what, what John's referring to here, he wants them to know the things that they already have known so that when somebody comes to them and says, yeah, but there is this, they're able to say, well, before you ever even showed up, this is what we know. So nothing's going to change those things that we know. And so same with us. Somebody could come here tomorrow and tell me all kinds of things. The Holy Spirit showed me this, and they've got all these different revelations and blah, 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 far into the night of the things that they say that they know. And yet I have everything that I need right here in front of me. And so anything that they say, if it doesn't absolutely square with the scripture, it's not even to be listened to. I'm not interested in it. And if they're just reiterating what I already have here in the word, then I need to remind them that they're not telling us something new. So stop acting like you've got some kind of brand new inside knowledge. We already know those things. So that was the problem. And fortunately for us, we've got all these years of, of history that we can look back on. But this is what you would expect. First century, the church is very young. The gospel is going into places where it had not been before. And uh, so the, I guess you could just say that the atmosphere and, the, and that part of the world was just ripe for these things taking place. We know from John's time, right in the book of Revelation, we know what part of the world he was in. And uh, so he was in what we would consider modern day Turkey. And uh, we also know this, that uh, the book of Colossians has really kind of as its central theme, the refutation of, um, of Gnosticism. So if you're looking at a, um, uh, if you're looking at, at any kind of uh, a map of like where the seven churches were, you're looking at, because like, it's usually going to be kind of zoomed in a little bit, but the seven churches are in what is the, the west coast of modern day Turkey. And so as you look at them, as they go in like an arch, starting at Ephesus and then ending with Philadelphia, Colossae would be down here. So it's all in the same neighborhood, Ephesus, where Paul spent all of his time. And then off the coast of there, where, where um, John was ultimately exiled, is a place there uh, called Patmos. And that's where, where um, he wrote the book of Revelation. So he's in that part of the world. So the idea that he would be having to maybe contend with Gnostics and Gnosticism and warning the church against it makes perfect, perfect sense. So again, if, if you have a group of people kind of come onto the scene in the church saying, I have this knowledge, then you're going to want to be able to say to the church, yeah, but there are things that you know, and you know them and you've known them all along. And they are things again, so let's fast forward a couple thousand years to us. Nobody's going to bring something brand new that's never been seen before. That's just nonsense. Um, so I, I don't, I, I kind of just dismiss them out of hand. And, you know, sometimes you hear it's, if anything, half of it, half the time your mind thinks oh, it's really kind of funny to listen to these people. And the other half is just, I'm really sad that these people believe those things, that they're getting some kind of private revelation when everything that we need to know is already here for us. So very, very important that we recognize that. And uh, you'll, you'll find here that, um, that John uses all throughout this text the talk of uh, the discussion of knowledge and his reason for writing these things, that they could know these things. He speaks to them about the love of God, the love that they should have one for another, the, the love that they should have for their Savior, for their Creator. And again, it's just a, it's a word that's used prolifically. Whether it's done as an action or just a description of the thing we know as love, in this case agape, that they are supposed to be familiar with, operate in, and it should be the function of their lives. So what it, what it tells you is when somebody has a particular topic that, <clears throat> that they <coughs> excuse me, are so locked in and focused in, laser beam kind of focus on it, that means that there's something taking place in that particular church that they really need to pay attention to. So it's with that in mind, what we read here in verses 12, 13, and 14 is kind of setting the table of here is who you are. 
here's who you have always been. And uh, especially for those that are more seasoned in the faith, this is where you've been all along. And so really there's, there's three groups of people that are mentioned here. And we'll look at the, the some people look at it as very literal, that he's, he's writing to uh, not only little children, but he's writing to, you know, kind of younger men, youthful men, and then also to the age, to the fathers, as though it's being written uh, to uh, the, the, the family way of things. But it's being written more in the spiritual family kind of a way, which would work a little bit better because then it includes all of the women in this case. Um, we can kind of look at it both ways. Here's the one thing we know for sure. If John's just writing to the, the, the whole church versus a family of a, of a father and a son and a child, his, his encouragement to them is going to be identical. It's vital that they understand what it is that God needs of them or requires of them rather and what it is that they should know, what makes them who they are, all those kind of things. It's going to have a universal application throughout the entirety of the church. But um, he singles out children, and he uses a couple of different descriptions for them, which kind of gives it more the impression that it's, it's said in the spiritual sense, so that it does encompass women, and that it, it uh, addresses, like I say, these youthful, these young men, and then these elder, the father, uh, the father figures. So... We'll get into that, but the things that are said are really, really wonderful. <clears throat> so 1 John uh, chapter 2, uh, we start off at verse 12, and let's have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to put something up uh, on, the, um, on, the, uh, on the screen that you'll be able to look at and kind of know how the, the whole chapter or whole, this section starts breaks it down a little bit because it gets a little bit wordy and we're jumping around between, well, who's he speaking to? The father, the children, the son, who's being spoken of and what are the things that are being said to them? So uh, I'll put that up here. Let's pray first and then I'll put it up so that you can screenshot it and have it uh, there and uh, looking at it as we go through this. You don't need to see my face. Father, we thank you so much for your, your work in us and for what has been accomplished in the person of Jesus, what he has done for us. We would ask, Lord, that you would help us in our understanding of your word and that you would grow us through the things that we see here. And uh, we thank you once again for your faithfulness to teach us your word by the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that we would be attentive to these things, encouraged and strengthened, built up. The things that we see said of these people that are mentioned here, we pray that the same could be said of us as we would grow in our understanding of you. So we give you all thanks and pray that you would be glorified in the teaching of your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. All right, so what I want to do is put up um, a, uh, a list, a just kind of a simple breakdown of this, and uh, it, it kind of helps us with our understanding of what exactly is being said here. So if you look at what's uh, addressed, let's just start with to the children. You'll notice that in verse 12, it says, um, I'm writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven. But he addresses them again as little children. Uh, the children are addressed once again in verse 13, where it says, I've written to you children because you know the Father. So there are those things that they know. Their sins have been forgiven and they know the Father. When it comes to the fathers, he says, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him. Now notice the, the, the idea of knowledge here is such an important part. Look at verse 14. It says, I write to you, I have written to you fathers because you know him who was from the beginning. And then to the young man, I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And then you see in verse 14, he says, I have written. Notice all of these later ones in verse 14 uh, and the end of 13, I have written. So there's the, the writing and then the have written. But the second one to the young man found in verse 14, it says, to you, young men, I've written uh, because you are strong. He adds that. And the word of God abides in you. He's added that. And you have overcome. That's once again, the same thing that he has said earlier in verse 13, the evil one. So it is with that understanding that we uh, come back to what the text has to say, and we'll look at those in individual things. So there is the, the three people, the three groups that are addressed here. He starts in a very general sense in verse 12, but in verse 13, he has the three things. I write to you, children, young men, fathers. And then once again, he doesn't, it's not the exact same order but he addresses those groups of people. And so it's the children, the fathers, and then the, the youth. So important that, that we recognize the, 
the point is to, to you'll definitely notice that there is a a order in the sense of maturity if nothing else which is what kind of gives rise to the understanding of there are those people that are in their infancy as far as believers referred to as children those ones who have really kind of settled into their their uh walk with god but they still have that youthful vigor that is there and they've overcome as we see at the end but then there's little children those ones that are young in the faith but they have these assurances. All of them have these wonderful assurances, and that's what we really want, kind of want to focus on, to recognize, again, if he's, if he's writing this as a way of, of refuting the Gnostics, it would make sense that you would be talking about going from the beginning of your walk with the Lord up to maturity, and so that would be from children to fathers. So, again, if he's using the family as a way of illustration, and it's as though he's addressing them as individual family members, but we also recognize that the Bible uh, uses uh, the, the idea of the family in a spiritual sense as well. And I kind of tend to favor this could be looked at more as he addresses them in the spiritual sense so as not to exclude the wives and the daughters. So that we kind of get from verse 12 uh, because he says that as little children and it's the same thing that he says in chapter 2 verse 1 when he mentions to little children and it's said as encompassing the entirety of the church so remember by this time John is quite aged he's uh, he's a very very he's an elderly man he's writing this in the in, at the very end of the first century and he was uh, he was a youthful man uh, when he met Jesus some 60 years before so if we do the math he's aged quite a bit he's you know exactly how old we don't know but he's up there uh, at the writing of this because again we don't know for sure the writing of it but it would give indication because he can say I have written versus I am writing that it would allude back to probably his gospel of the things that he has said because he borrows from some of the exact same phrases and uh, as I had pointed out in uh, the first chapter of this epistle it's clear that this is the same John writing on the same topic but one was written to the very general audience and it's written in a very scholarly way very theological here he's writing in a very personal way about the person of Jesus that he knew and wants to make him known to them the, the person of Jesus is, is something on a very personal level that he wants them to know so with that being the case of course he would refer to them as, as dear children of course he's very very much elderly and uh, certainly one who would speak with as much authority as anyone could possibly speak with authority he's John the Apostle so all of that in background just kind of think helps a little bit with our understanding of what's actually being said here so with that let's uh, let's look at our text let's just read through it and then we'll go back and we'll pick through the components of it so he says I write to you little children why because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake now I'm gonna emphasize this because and it, it's it's very simply for the simple fact that he says that very same word. I write this to you, and here's the reason. Because. Verse 13, he says, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, uh, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, now past tense, I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. And I have written to you, young men, because you have, you are strong, rather, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So if you notice, just by saying that, this is intended to let them know who they are positionally in the person of Jesus, where they are in their level of maturity, where they are in their walk with the Lord, and from the young to the aged and again that's why i believe I, I i favor the view this is not being sent to only children and again because he uses a, a term a little bit later on that, that really is the word that's used more for infant and uh, it's hard to write to an infant and expecting them to understand but if you're speaking to infants in the faith they can be any age uh, if you're writing to somebody who may be, you know, quite a bit more advanced in their years and have been walking with the Lord for some time, they're seen as a father figure in the faith. And so that, that terminology of being a father in the faith is used all throughout the scripture. So very, very important that we recognize what's being meant there. So um, they have that, that, kind of, that, that kind of fatherly feel to them, and they've earned it. 
And so that's the important part to recognize as well. It's not just a title that's bestowed upon a person by the church. It's actually exemplified. It's, it's actually shown and demonstrated through their life. So let's look at the actual uh, pieces of this. Or, or before we do that, let me, let me point out why I, I want to just segment verse 12 through 14. Because he's saying, this is who makes you who you are. This is where you are in the church uh, as far as, again, I believe maturity's sake. Here's where you are fitting in that. And he says in verse 15, notice how he has this change of topic because he's not he's going to start getting into error. What he's given them is the encouragement. Here's how to not be in error. You know who you are. So don't worry about what people would kind of come to say to you. Do not love the world nor the things of the world. And if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Just that those two verses right there, they stand in absolute stark contrast to the assurances given to the people that are here. Because remember what he has actually said to them when he comes to the youth. You've overcome the enemy, you're strong, and that means in your faith, you're, you're not, it's not a, a physical kind of a thing. And uh, it's, it's, the importance of it is, again, being overcomers, the word abiding in those young men, that's what he says about them. And the fathers, that they have known the, the, the one who is from the beginning. They have known God, and it's that you've known him for some time. And to the infants, once again, you know this, you are forgiven. And so that, that simple understanding of where we are from the time that we first get saved to wherever we are in our, our uh, relationship with the Lord, it is always intended to be a matter of growth that is never supposed to stagnate. It certainly is never supposed to go in reverse order. We don't start forgetting things. We're supposed to be gaining our understanding and knowledge because it really helps us to be moored to the, to the, the ground of our faith, knowing what it is that we believe so that we are not really stumbled by the things that will be introduced. That's kind of what he gets to starting it next week in verse 15. So it's best to be able to say, Maturity in the faith, knowing what it is that we know, being encouraged in that is the, is the single greatest way that we avoid falling into the error. And if your like is being referred to here, you're going to find as you walk more and more with the Lord, you are more dependent on the Holy Spirit to help you understand the scriptures and to apply them to your life and how it is that you're supposed to walk. Then that way you're not susceptible to the error. So important. So Really, really good stuff. Chapter twelve or uh, chapter two, verse twelve says this. Now, I write to you, little children. Now, it's the same term that he uses there in verse uh, one of chapter two. As I get, I said again, let's just read it. it. Says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And you could say he uses the same kind of just straightforward sentence structure. I write to you these things for this purpose. In this case, that you do not sin, but if anyone does, we have an advocate with the Father. You see, it's that point counterpoint. I write to you these things so that you can have this assurance. In this case, he says, but if we do, if sin is an issue, we also have a parakletos, a, an advocate with the Father. And who is that? Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's able to do so. So in this case here, I write to you, little children. Now, why is that? I write to you because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So if we were to say now this little children, since it's applied in the most general sense in verse one of chapter two, we should be able to take this because you'll notice that nowhere in this verse does he get to fathers and youth. He, he mentions the children and then he kind of resets in the next two verses by going through those that three groups of people, the children, the fathers, the youth. So if he's speaking to the church in general, which I believe that he is, he says this, and this is really entry level. Every Christian, I don't care how long you've been walking with the Lord, this is where we all began. We all start here. And it is this. It says, these things I write to you, or I write this to you, little children, and what for what reason? That your sins are forgiven you. So, now notice that there's no uncertainty in this. That this is, the sins are already in the past tense forgiven. And so you walk in that forgiveness. Now, he's already explained that since we have been forgiven, we don't fall in and out of that. Uh, the forgiveness is something that is settled in him. And to those who have accepted his forgiveness, we walk in that. If we're, if we're walking in that, then there's really no disputing this. It's just a statement of fact. And this is something that is supposed to be understood by them. <clears throat> 
no matter how young you are, you can always come back and revert to this truth. My sin is forgiven. Now, the second part of it that he says, it is for his name's sake. Now, that can mean a whole lot, all the same things, but it's really how many layers of depth do you want to go into it? If we take it at the most basic elementary level, that we are saved for his name's sake, we are saved because of what he has accomplished, his name's sake, that who he is and what he did, he accomplished those things. So it's through and in him that we are saved. <clears throat> but also, let's remember, there's a, another layer to it that goes even deeper by saying, we're saved because he had made to us promises and because he said he would do particular things like anyone who comes to me, I will in no ways cast out that idea that he came to seek and save that which was lost. All the things that he promised to do, he did those things. And as a result of that, we are able to say because of what he has done, since we have trusted in those things, then we can say that we are saved for his name's sake because he said that he would because it is in him that we are saved, it's not by our own efforts. So this wonderful, again, <clears throat> every believer starts here. We are saved as dear children, seen in the eyes of John, as children to him in the faith, but more importantly, children of God himself, remembering what John has to say about that, I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, behold what manner, of the love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. We're gonna get that in chapter three hugely important that we recognize that it's it is him uh, who to whom we are our children and he's the one who has done this work for us on our behalf so he says this in verse 13 now he's going to start to get into this matter of fathers and then of youth and then of children so he says I write to you then fathers so what's he going to say to fathers now once again it's really not getting worth getting into an argument. There are some who would look at this and, and he's really writing this in the familial sense, like to a literal father, a literal youth in the family, and a child in the family. Some people view it that way. That's fine. Because, um, again, he would have the same admonition, whether it was to the church as a whole, using it figuratively, fathers, youth, children. Or if he was saying it to one particular, you know, hey, only you fathers need to pay the attention to this part. You youth need to pay attention to this. You children need to pay attention to this. The, the masculine is, is inferred just by the English in both the, the father and of the, of the youth, but not of the child. It's kind of universal. Of course, that leaves out the, the middle, you know, the, the girls that are in their adolescence or above and then the older women. So we don't, we don't see why they would be excluded from this. So it makes more sense to do it and view it in, in more the way of you have the aged, you have the young, and you have the very young. That works well for the entirety of the church, of course, which John would be concerned with all of the above. So if he speaks to the aged, I write to you fathers because, and here's why, because you have known him who is from the beginning, you have this recognition of the eternal God. You know him better than what you did when you were a child. And every one of us can say that. If you've been, a, if you've been walking with the Lord for any length of time, you know this. The, the same God that you have trusted in from the beginning of your, your walk of salvation with him, you know him much better than you did back at the, uh, at the beginning. But he also is that one who has been from everlasting. You know him as the everlasting God. We know that um, John is really careful about this topic, not only from what we see in his gospel in the first chapter, chapter, but also what he has to say. He's using the same terminology, that which was from the beginning, which we get right here in the first chapter of this epistle. He's being consistent with his language. So you have known Fathers, you have known, and it's been for a while that you have known him. He's talking about age here. You're this one. We get to fathers, the way that it's used, oftentimes it's used these people that are advanced in age. And again, we're, we're speaking of spiritual things because he can find plenty of people who might be the same age. Let's just pick a random number and say 70 years old. If they are 70 years old but have never been in the faith, you're not going to make the same thing. You haven't known him who is from the beginning, the eternal God. So he's obviously speaking to those who have for some time known about this eternal God. So you know him who is from the beginning, not from your beginning of your salvation, but him who from the beginning of his creation is known. 
And so whoever knows him and has for some length of time grows in that knowledge of him. So he goes on and he says this, because you have known him from the beginning. And now he says, I write to you, young men, and here's why, because you have overcome the wicked one. Notice once again, in all of these, the tense is not you're coming to this knowledge or you'll come to that knowledge down the road. You have already come to this knowledge. Continue on in that knowledge. There is the, the anticipated, expected continuation of that. So this idea of overcoming something means that it's an obstacle. It's the common one that we get for overcoming in the way of being victorious. You have gained victory. You have defeated the, the evil one that has looked to entice you and pull you away from things. So as you've grown from your childhood on towards your maturity and your adulthood and your older age, the father kind of a figure in this matter, you have gone to that place of overcoming those hurdles at the beginning victorious, and you've overcome everything that has been put before you in the attempt to try and keep you from, from truth. That's what we get in verses 15 and 16 for the people who have not, wouldn't have been here, they would have been susceptible or they may have fallen into those kind of things. This is speaking to the people who have overcome those things, the pride of life, the lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Those would be things that needed to be overcome because those are the things that are of the world, as he says here. So remember, we want to be really careful with this. What we see here in verses 12 through 14 yeah, it works as a topic because we're kind of handling it as this is what it says right here. But let's remember that the things that he says that they are to keep themselves from, they need to continue to keep themselves from it. If they're overcomers, the fathers would fit in that category. The young men have already overcome. The time will be when the young ones will have to overcome those things again. And he enumerates them in some extent. There's so much larger of list we could get from this, but it's just really, really interesting in uh, the way that he says the things that he says and how independent or, or how dependent rather these sections are one over, over another. And let me do one last thing before we read the next one. What I genuinely hope that we do is we read through this and it really is helpful to us as a way of kind of gauging these matters of maturity, recognizing that what God wants to see is is that we've grown through all of these stages and we've gone on to that idea of maturity. Not that we ever fully get there, you know, but it's it's a pursuit. And you want to be able to say, if we did it, sometimes people get frustrated if we try to do it day by day. Let's just say week by week, month by month, year by year, whatever you want to use. Am I growing in my understanding and my relationship with the Lord? Am I more dependent upon him now than I was last year, last month, whatever the case may be? Because we want to see that as we draw nearer to him, the things of the world seem further in the rearview mirror, not to be returned to. They're not catching up to us. We're just walking away from those things. We're leaving them behind, never to go back. We continue to press on, which again, he, he gives the impression with the wording that's in here that that's the case that's taking place in them, but it has to be the expectation. This is where we need to be going. I just love the, the phrasing of this and how he really does start to lay out for us a, what I think is just a, an incredible picture here. So now he has uh, already talked to the young men who have overcome the wicked one, and now he wants to turn his attention to the children. I write to you, little children. Why? Because you have known the Father. Now, if we look up at the very first part of verse 12, we know that it says that we know that our sins are forgiven. And by knowing that our sins are forgiven, we've been understanding who the Father is. Let's remember for each of us, because it's always good to remember. Whoever it was that first preached the gospel to you, and again, everybody's situation is a little bit different. Uh, some people got saved because they went down front at an invitation. Some people went to a conference or a concert or something, and the invitation was given. Some people did it on television. Some people did it from reading their Bible. There is no cookie cutter way that anybody ever comes to that point, wherever it is, where you finally get to that point of saying, I am dead in my sin and trespass. And if I don't cry out to him and seek his forgiveness, I will be separated from him for eternity. Whenever that happened, Whenever that took place, you put your trust and your faith exclusively and absolutely in the finished work of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. Really an amazing thing. From that point on, we start to learn about who he is. 
if we're going to be studying the things that he says, we're going to hear him say, the things that I'm saying to you, I haven't sent, I have, I'm not doing them on my own. I'm doing them because of the Father who sent me. Oh, wait, so there's a Father in this as well? So you're the Son who has saved me, but there's your Father? We're going to start to grow in those kind of things. We're going to learn about who God is in his very nature. And he's revealed to us in different ways. Jesus would say, I'm the Son who has taken upon myself a body of flesh and blood and dwelt among you sent here by the Father to do his will, and here I am in, in human form in the flesh to pay the price for man's sin. By the time John's writing this, and now in our days, we don't have Jesus standing right next to us, but we do have the Holy Spirit, who he promised would be sent when he left. So he would be the one who would pick up where Jesus left off, because he was confined to one body in one place. But when he went back to the Father and the Spirit was sent, now he's everywhere. By the Spirit of God, we are indwelt, and the Holy Spirit resides in all believers everywhere at the same time all throughout the earth. And it's been that way since Pentecost. So, or not Pentecost, rather, but since the upper room. Uh, so, John 20, um, starting at verse 19, you can read that. But when Jesus resurrected, he conquered sin and death, so there was no reason for man to be separated from God, spiritually speaking. We're alive to him because of that. That's all stuff that we need to know and to fully understand. So... With that being said, <clears throat> we're able to look at this and say, we went from that place of just introductory, come to the Lord and seek him for his forgiveness, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, to at the end of verse 13, we write to you because you know the Father. Well, I know the Father because I know the Son. And in his own words, he says that. He says, I've, I've made you known to them in a number of different places. And there's just too many that are rattling around in my brain to try to cite them. But go back and look at where Jesus speaks about the Father and our relationship with the Son, our relationship with the Father. If you want a good starting point for it, read the entirety of chapter 17 of John's Gospel. Interestingly enough, John. And so you, you just find that his John's Gospel so influences his epistles, it's, it's amazing. Though he is taking what he knows and what he learned from Jesus, and he's applying it to the days in which we live, he lived, and it was to warn them about things that were coming and things that were already taking place in the church. That's why it's very good for us to make application to that. And we'll do that starting next week, but let's make application to this. Because if he says this to the first century church, if he was addressing us directly and through the Holy Spirit he is, how do we read this? And where we see ourselves in this, how does this apply? So again, if we were to just look through those things, do I know that my, my sins are forgiven for his sake? If you're a believer, you have to say yes to that. I write to you, verse 13, fathers, you've known him who is from the beginning. Do we know God, the eternal one who always has and always will be? The creator of all things, Genesis 1, 2, and then into 3, when he started his relationship with mankind and bringing Eve to Adam and all of that kind of stuff. And then the fall of, of, of man in, in sin in chapter 3. All that stuff is right there. So again, do we know the God who has been there from the beginning? And do we write? Do we look at what's said here of the young men? Because we've overcome the wicked one. The, the wicked one who looks to entice and entertain us into other things away from him. Have we been able to say, yeah, we understand this? Or are we able to look at the second or the last of verse 13 where it says, I write to you little children. Why? Because you have known the Father. You've known him all along since you came to know who the Lord is. You've known him. So again, we read these things and we say, I know all these things on a personal basis. And knowledge is the issue here. Now, it's not knowledge he's just speaking about something. It's this is a verb. It's an action. You know him this way. <clears throat> it's not you should know him this way. You could know him this way. You ought to know him this way. You do know him like this. So if you're going to be answering the Gnostics, we have knowledge that's different. We have something that's new, and they're going to start to try to entice you with all those things. We're able to say, no, no, no. I already know these things. Here's what I know, not what you're trying to sell. Here's what I know about the, the scriptures and what they have to say. I know the God who helps me to overcome. I know the God who has forgiven my sins. I know the Father who has been made known to me because of the Son. You know, we're able to say, these are things that I know. It's not, I haven't read them in a book. This is my life. I know these things because it's what makes me tick. It's what animates me. I know these things. So again, there are things that we can know because it's written here in the text. That's what we want to be able to stand upon because God says he honors his word. I don't want to stand before him someday and say, I believed all these things because 
that guy told me or because I just rationalized it in my own mind. I want to be able to say, I believe the things that I believe because, well, your word says so. And not just in this verse right here, but it's also said right here as well, just so that I know that I'm reading it correctly. It's repeated again and again throughout your word. That's where we want to be. That's our, that should be kind of our dwelling place when it comes to matters of the truth. I don't need new knowledge. What I have is a knowledge that has been settled and in print for 2,000 years. Why do I need something different? So, very, very important that we understand these, these elements that are put in here. That are put in here, I should say. Now, verse 14 is where you find a change in the tense. Now, he says, I write, to this point, I'm writing, or I write to you here and now. But he says here, and it's important, I have written to you before. Now, it's given rise to what some people would think are a few different uh, options of when did he write to them? Is it some unknown to us? Or is it something that he's written earlier in the, in the first chapter, something before this time? Or is it referring back rather to the gospel? And uh, I'm of that opinion. It makes perfect sense that he's referring to them, that this, these epistles are written after the fact to really help to, to minister to them. Remember, you can take a look at the gospel as distinctly different, though it's heavily borrowed from in this writing here, but it's the difference of trying to make Jesus known to the whosoevers versus here John saying, the person that I know, Jesus, here's who he is to me and here is who he is to you. You need to know him like this because there are those that are going to try to tell you that he could be known in different ways. So we'll get into those different ways as we go through the book, but you'll see the cautions that he gives about people that may say that they know something that really argues against what we know to be true. So um, you can tell, you kind of piece it together. What was John so concerned about? You kind of get an idea when you look at his arguments against what he's arguing. So, or the things that he argues against, you can kind of, you can kind of put it together from there. So, in verse 14, he says, I have written to you. Now he, he is uh, speaking to the fathers. I am writing to you, or I have rather, in times past, past tense, I have written to you, again, fathers, same word that he uses up in verse 13, because you have known him who is from the beginning. So he pretty much says, look at what you see in verse 13, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. It's a reiteration of that. So if you're looking at, let's put the two pieces together. Fathers, aged in the, in the faith, you who've been around for a, a, the time, I'm, he's repeating himself. I've written to you in the past because you know the eternal God. I'm writing to you now for the same reason. And if that's the case, if this is a matter of looking at them in the years of their maturity and everything else, that is expected of them, pass it along. So it's not to be ever kept to ourselves, in fact, when we find a church working as it's supposed to, the people who have been advanced in the faith are there as a model to the younger people, whether they're in their, their you know, formative years as children or they're you know, kind of growing in their, in their faith and they're, they're more mature, but they're still younger people as far as just years. So this is just that, that nice, neat, orderly kind of church that functions as it's supposed to. So I have written to you, fathers, because, here's why, because you have known him who is from the beginning. So he says this, now I write to you, young men. Now here's why, do, why does he write to them? And here's where it's different than what he said before. Because if we look at what he says earlier in verse 13, middle part of it, I write to you, young men. Why? Because you have overcome the wicked one. Look at what else he adds here. I have written to you, young men, for what reason? Because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one, which I think we get a glimpse as to why uh, they are able to have overcome the wicked one, because he adds these other two elements that are here. The strength is one that it is of vitality and vigor and all that kind of stuff, but again, he's, spirit, he's speaking of spiritual matters. You don't overcome the, the wicked one because, or the evil one, because you're, you're physically fit and physically strong. It's not that kind of an engagement. You're not fighting with him in the, in the literal physical sense. But this is a strength of spirit, of maturity, of I've gone past my infancy. I'm not the old guy yet. I don't have that many years behind me, but I am at that place of having been the overcomer. 
God has made me victorious by not succumbing to those things that we've already read in verses 15 and 16 and a number of other places that we'll see that would, would really kind of, as we read on in the book, it would still, looking back to those people who have overcome, when he says overcome, you're at that point where you've been, the, the things that are going to be thrown at you to try to get you to, to turn away, you've already come past those things. You're victorious in them. So <clears throat> he says that you are strong that you are strong in the word and rather and the word of God abides in you and this word abides is the same one that we see John uses in John chapter 15 where he talks about this abiding between us and him and how many times you see the word abide read it for yourself it's uh, in the the uh, first or it's in the yeah it's in the first half of um, John's gospel in chapter 15 but he begins by saying I'm the vine and you're the branches so the vine and branches is, uh, is part of the seven I am's. In fact, it's the last of the I am's where he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, chapter 15. So important that we recognize yet again the, the reasons why he says the things that he says and, and why we are to understand them. And, uh, and, and what does it mean to abide other than it, it's you make your dwelling place with him. You continue on, and that's, you know, you're going to find that, that that's something that's talked about in the next study that we get to. It is something that you, you have a beginning of things, but the abiding means that it's an ongoing thing. So the idea of abiding in him, if we're looking at chapter 15 of John's gospel, he talks about us abiding in him, he and us. And so there's a, a back and forth, a relationship, but that it's progressed. It goes along, and we continue to do that. So we carry it along. It, that relationship continues. So he says of these young men, you have, because you are strong, because the word of God abides in you, it's alive to you, and that you have overcome the wicked one. Um, what he says earlier is uh, the same. That's, uh, that's a repetition of what we see in verse 13 to these people. He just adds those two elements in. But as we go through this, you're going to find that there are a number of places where you get the glimpse, you get the kind of hint that the Gnostics are in mind here. And the concern is that they, you know, not wanting to give heed to those people, the best way to, to really kind of give the assurance, because I know people that do this, I'm so afraid that I'll fall for whatever is being said. I'm so afraid that what people try to, to get me to believe, I might just be, you know, I might just believe those things. Well, if that's the case, look at the assurance that he gives here. But what are the elements of it? So whether it's to the children, know who it is that has saved you and know that, it, that that's something that you can put your trust in. You have come to know the Father because of the work of the Son and it's completed. Your sins are forgiven. If we want to say, well, so where do we go from there? Well, we want to get to the place that when the world looks to try to bring us back in, that we overcome, we become victorious. And how does that happen? The Word of God abides in us. We make it that, that thing that sustains us. We hold to it. We, we have that be our dwelling place. It, the, the, the Word of God has a place in us. It indwells our lives. We, we put our trust and our faith and our hope in those things. <clears throat> By doing so, there is an idea of overcoming and all of that, we look back and say, none of it was possible without the living God making it possible and doing this work in us. So we, like the fathers at that place, we've known him from the, who is from the beginning. And that's kind of where it comes all full circle. All of the things that are said to the children and to the youth, the fathers would be able to look back and say, I've been through each step that they've already been, and here's what I know. From the very beginning of creation, there's a creator who has loved his creation, and the, 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 the central theme of the Bible is the redemption of mankind and including the incredible cost of that. But I've known him from the beginning of my personal walk. He is the God who is from the beginning, the creator who loves me and gave himself for me. So again, if we're at that place where we're able to look back and say, no matter where I am in my spiritual walk, if my eyes are on him, the one who is from forever, you know, from eternity past, the creator God, then the world is going to try to entice me with things that are temporary. The temporal world, with all of its pursuits, is put there as an obstacle and a stumbling block to me. I don't want to be susceptible to those things. What I want to do is to be that overcomer that's spoken of as the youth. I want to have that childlike faith, knowing that my sins are forgiven and that I know the Father. But I want that overcoming because of strength of, uh, of my belief and that it cannot be overcome. 
So you see the, the way that he's doing all this is to try to encourage them wherever they are in their, in their walk with him to keep their eyes focused on him because he's going to give us the caution. The world is going to look to ruin you and get you to do something different. Stay with what you know and realize that it's not about you. He's the one who has saved you. He's the one. It's his word that abides in you. You look to our salvation and us being in him. It's nothing about what we bring to the equation. It's what he's already done. We just simply walk in what's been done for us. That's the admonition that's here. So um, what we have uh, before us next week is, again, really detailed stuff. It's why I didn't want to try to tackle it along with uh, what we did today, which is why we're kind of going to end a little bit early today. But if you have any questions on this and, and what I've shared, uh, make sure that you just uh, contact me through the email or if you're watching this on YouTube and you want further information, you want to you know, kind of delve into some of this stuff even deeper than this, if there's something that, that was left maybe you know, not fully understood, then contact me, or, or like I say, through the, the website, oldpaththeology.net, or in the comment section here on YouTube. And I, I'd love to have interaction with you if you have any questions. So we're going to pick up at verse 15 next week, and we will get into the cautions about those who have, um, have looked to other things. And uh, they may have at one point been right alongside with the rest of the people in the church, and yet there's something different about them. So we're going to get into it. Some interesting, interesting stuff. We'll take our time with it. Very, very important topic. So we'll pick up next week at verse 15. Mm -hmm.